today is the second part of our five part series and I'll be talking about uh, VA benefits, specifically pension and service connected disability uh, versus the social security benefits of uh, SSDI and SSI, the social security disability income and supplemental security income. All right, just a little about me before I start. Um, it, I am a 16 year attorney. Um, I'm licensed here in Florida and California and uh, federal courts uh, in the middle district of Florida and the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Um, my father was a civilian in the Navy as an engineer and my husband is an army veteran. So those are my ties to the military and veterans. Um, I first started in uh, nursing homes doing administration and marketing, but later went back to school to go into law school. And after that, I worked in the private sector uh, of many different law firms or size law firms, I should say, including my own. And I practiced uh, quite a range of, um, of areas of law from elder abuse and medical malpractice litigation, probate, state planning, and social security disability are, are a few of those. Um, and then in 2016, I came to um, Community Legal Services, uh, where I started as a helpline attorney. Um, and from there, I moved on to the public benefits unit as a staff attorney and then later became the manager of the public benefits unit. And our public benefits unit houses our veterans uh, advocacy project and our veterans work. So I have been handling uh, veterans benefits uh, along with other public benefits like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, reemployment assistance, and food stamps uh, during my time here on the public benefits unit. Um, I do sit on the Orlando City Mayor's Veterans Advisory Council, and that is um, how we are able to do this series. So thank you to them. Um, and I work very closely with Supportive Services for Veterans and Families, SSVF, and providing holistic services to the veterans who are homeless and at risk of homelessness. Uh, and I am also the chairperson for the Central Florida Reentry Networks uh, Veterans Subcommittee. So today, um, what uh, what I'm going to do this is this is my chart to kind of outline everything, um, the differences uh, and the and the requirements and. Uh, VA pension and disability, social, uh, I keep saying that wrong, sorry, social security disability insurance and supplemental security income. Um, but I think before going into this in too much depth, it's important to understand the different programs just by themselves before talking about them together. So service connected disability, there are five main types of service connection. Uh, there's direct service connection, service connection through aggravation, presumptive service connection, secondary service connection, uh, service connection for injuries caused by VA healthcare. For direct service connection, it is uh, the requirements or standard that needs to be shown is that the injury or illness started during active duty, that there is current treatment of that injury or illness, and that it is the same uh, cause that they, that active duty actually caused what is currently being treated. And this sometimes can be difficult if it has been many years since, uh, since discharge from the service and from active duty. And for reservists and National Guard, if 
um, there was no deployment, if it was uh, something that started during active duty training, that does count for service connected disability for that step one. Service-connected disability uh, through aggravation uh, is very similar. It's just a pre-existing condition that, uh, that went into the military with this pre-existing -pre condition that the disability worsened while it was in service. So it, it got aggravated while there um, and above and beyond the natural, natural progression of the disability. So something that happened had to have happened while in the service to um, aggravate the condition and the worsening continued. It's a permanent worsening. The presumptive service connection, there's a couple different ways this comes into play. Uh, veterans within one year of release uh, or discharge from active duty and if they're diagnosed with chronic diseases, um, there is, uh, I, I'd actually say more of a presumption that it is going to be caused by service connection um, than if you wait. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, uh, having the long wait, wait of time in there makes it harder to show. And it's, this helps to be uh, to presume that it happened during service, if it's within one year. Uh, with For veterans with continuous service of 90 days or more, if they're diagnosed with ALS, otherwise known as Lou Gehrig's disease, at any time after discharge or release um, from their qualifying active service, um, there is a presumption um, of, of service connection for them. All right, and then there are other presumptions as well. Former prisoners of war have a list of presumptive diagnoses. Diagnoses, uh, Vietnam veterans who were exposed to Agent Orange, uh, atomic veterans, meaning veterans uh, while in service were exposed to ionizing radiation. Uh, and then Gulf War veterans also have a list of presumed uh, conditions as well. Um, one that's not listed on here too is uh, Camp Lejeune. Uh, there's, there was a drinking water contamination. Um, so for people who were active duty stationed at Camp Lejeune, uh, there is a list of conditions for them uh, if they were there during a specific time period. And then secondary service connection is a, it's a, would be a new claim, but something that's linked to an already determined service-connected disability. So if you have, say you have arthritis, um, but you already have a service-connected or rated knee injury, a uh, rated disability as a knee injury, then the arthritis uh, might be able to be coming to be claimed as a secondary claim. Um, another example, develop heart disease that's caused by high blood pressure when you were diagnosed with, uh, that you were diagnosed with while on active duty and that the VA previously concluded was service connected. And then service connection for injuries caused by VA healthcare. So a veteran who is injured in a VA hospital or other facility can get disability uh, through the VA. They also have the right to file an administrative claim under the Federal Torts Claim Act. Uh, but if both are filed or if you, yeah, both are filed and successful, the disabilities are offset by the uh, FTCA awards. But there is something out there. So the, the theme of these all though are that they are service connected. It was something that, that happened or um, resulted by some way 
through active duty or healthcare in the VA. And that's different from the veteran's pension because a veteran's pension is non-service connected. So it's disability benefits still, but it's for conditions that are not related to the military service and active duty. So eligibility requirements, it's, it's actually a pretty long list. Um, if you didn't receive the, oops, sorry. As long as your discharge was not dishonorable um, and there is income limits on it. So you have to have both of those pieces that the family income and net worth are under a certain limit set by Congress. Uh, and you would have to have um, had at least one day in wartime. The length of your service is dependent on when you were serving. Um, or if you were an officer and started active duty after October 16th, 1981, and had not previously served on active duty for at least 24 months. And then the last part of it is um, that you're at least 20, uh, at least 65 years old, have a, or you have a permanent and total disability, or your patient in a nursing home because of the disability, or if you are receiving uh, SSDI or SSI. And permanent and total disability, as I just mentioned, is one of the, one of the uh, factors that is looked at um, that can make you eligible for pension. Uh, VA determines permanent disability by looking at whether the disabilities are likely to improve. The VA, there are different programs under the VA pension. There's aid in attendance or household benefits. Um, both of those programs provide monthly payments that are added to the amount of the pension um, as long as the person is qualified, uh, veteran or survivor. And then there is a survivor's pension as well, which offers monthly payments to qualified surviving spouses and unmarried dependent children of veterans who would have met the pension requirements. And as long as they still meet the income and net worth limits. So what are those limits? Um, there is countable income that they look at. So if, if you are getting social security benefits, any retirement benefits, any, um, any kind of income really, um, <clears throat> they take those, they might look at some of the uh, expenses um, that aren't covered by insurance to be able to reduce the income. Like if there is a uh, Medicare premium is being paid, uh, that would help to reduce that income. And then they look at what that maximum amount of pension payable is and they would take the maximum amount and subtract the yearly income. And as long as the maximum amount is above the yearly income, then what is left is the VA pension amount. And again, the maximum amount is going to vary depending on dependents, marriage, um, if the if the veteran does qualify for housebound or aid and attendance benefits, those are all going to make that maximum amount increase. Oh, wait, did I show that last part? <clears throat> so in 2021, the net worth to be eligible for veterans benefits is 130,000. <clears throat> and the net worth is the income plus uh, assets that a person would have. 
All right, so social security, now we get into the social security benefits. Social security disability insurance, it's also called SSDI, is, uh, does require that a person is disabled um, and their definition of disabled is that the person is unable to participate in substantial gainful activity, which is work, <laughs> that they have a, uh, an amount uh, that, that would be considered uh, substantial gainful activity. If you're earning more than that amount, then it, that's what that equals. Um, but if you're unable to participate in the substantial gainful activity due to a medically determinable or mental or physical impairment, uh, and that, that those impairments have lasted or are expected to last at least 12 months or result in death. Um, and that, so then what SSDI also requires is that there be another, a certain amount of credits um, within 10 years. So they look at how many years worked up to 10 years. It all depends on the age and that would determine the credits available right, that would go towards the SSDI. And that's how they determine SSDI is really like it says insurance. And so you're paying into the system is what's happening. And, and depending on how much you're paying into the system is how long you're insured for. And uh, if you've been working a full 10 years and get all those credits, then, then your date last insured uh, is, is hopefully substantially farther out than uh, when it's needed, if it's needed. So there are charts for that um, to look at what the age is of disability and how many credits are needed. Um, and the credits are dependent on the number of years worked. So um, someone at 30 years old, if they have worked two years, then they would have eight credits because it does it, they formerly called these quarters as opposed to credits. And because you've got four quarters in a year. Um, so. <clears throat> so you've got this chart shows from 21 all the way up to 62. Um, if 62 or older would have to have the 10 years of work or more. All right, so, and the supplemental security income has the same definition of disabled. It's a lot of people don't realize you still need to have the disabled uh, standard met in order to get SSI, just like SSDI. The difference between SSI and SSDI is that SSI requires a uh, there's an income limit for SSI, similar to the VA pension. There is an income limit uh, here as well. Uh, maximum resources have to be below $2,000 for an individual or $3,000 for a married couple. Uh, and that would be, again, the how much is in the bank, what, how much is coming in, they look at that. Um, the income can't be more than the uh, maximum benefit. Um, in 2021, it is $794 for an individual. Uh, that would be the payment. So if there's income coming in over that amount, then it, they wouldn't get that amount. It would be offset by whatever income is coming in as long as it's countable income. So countable income includes the wages and includes uh, money coming in from pensions, social security, other social security benefits, any of the VA benefits, um, but it does offset. So it does, um, you can still get those, but it will offset the amount that you can get from SSI. Um, what is not included in the income is the first $20 of most income, um, the first $65 of wages and half of the wages over that $65. Um, if there is, 
if the person is getting food stamps, energy assistance, or any other assistance based on need, then that is excluded from income. Grants and scholarships for school is ex are excluded. Loans that are needed to be repaid are excluded. Um, cost of impairment related work expenses and disaster assistance. So before I go back to my chart, do, do we have any questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just kind of flowing right through here. So um, feel free to ask questions. I'm sorry. I think uh, I'm, Michelle might have put that in there. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. We'll also do some uh, question and answer at the end as well. Um, so here's my handy dandy chart <laughs> that I started with. Um, so the the biggest thing with VA uh, benefits you are whether it's service connected, not service connected. Um, the, just to kind of recap, the VA pension is not service connected. It is income based. It does have other requirements like the wartime era, the amount of time in service. Um, if the person's over 65, 100% disabled, or if they're receiving SSDI or SSI. Um, and a person on VA pension can work, but that income has to be below the maximum amount set. Um, and they can get SSDI or SSI as, as in the require, requirements, um, but the pension amount will be offset by that. Now they can't get a VA pension with VA disability. Uh, usually the disability is going to be higher, so it, it just naturally offsets itself anyway. Um, the VA disability is a recap, so, uh, is service connected. They don't worry about the income with the disability. Uh, any, the other requirements is that it was either active duty caused or uh, aggravated uh, or that there was active duty training when the injury or illness occurred. Um, and a person on a uh, service-connected disability can work as long as they are not 100% disabled. If a person is 100% disabled, then it is uh, presumed that they're not able to work. Um, and they, you can get SSI, SSDI while you're on uh, service-connected disability, while you're receiving a service-connected disability. There are various levels of disability. So depending on the rating and dependence is dependent on how much you would be able to get in your disability benefit. Uh, if something is rated at 0%, that's because it is not compensable for whatever reason. It could be that it was service connected, but it just isn't severe enough to get payment. Um, it, I've also seen it where people have had an other than honorable discharge and they get 0% just because they, um, they won't pay on the other, other than honorable discharge, but they are, agreeing it is service connected. And so that person may be able to get health benefits uh, with that service connection determination. For SSDI, um, the person qualifies based on the amount of money they put into the system. Uh, they are have to meet the definition of disabled. They can work, um, but they cannot go over whatever the yearly amount is. Um, in 2021, I'm blanking now, the, the maximum amount of income per month at where it would be considered substantial gainful activity, I think we're at a, approximately 1,300 a month right now. Um, so a person would not be able to earn more than that in income by working. Otherwise, it'll be determined that the person's not disabled and can work. 
Um, with SSDI, a person can get the pen, a VA pension or disability. They can get SSI. Again, the SSI would be offset by SSDI and usually kind of like the pension, the VA pension and disability, the SSDI is generally going to be more than SSI. So in the chance that they haven't worked enough, put enough into the system that SSDI is below uh, the maximum amount of SSI that can be paid, then they can get both. Um, with SSDI, it automatically converts um, at, to full retirement uh, at 65 as long as it's um, the re retirement is the higher benefit. Um, disability is all or nothing. It doesn't have ratings like the VA does. Uh, SSI is the income-based program for Social Security, which still does require a disability at most ages, I should say. Once a person is, um, is 62 or higher, it's going to, um, it's really going to be dependent on how much they, uh, it's gonna look just at the income portion at that and what their retirement benefit would be. Um, they can work, again, as long as it doesn't go over the yearly amount, but also as long as it doesn't go over the maximum Social Security or sub, uh, SSI amount. So this year, 794. Um, they can get a pension or VA disability. They can get SSDI. All these amounts are offset from their um, SSI payment. Um, now, with SSI, a person is required to convert that at 62, so they would be claiming early retirement um, if there are retirement benefits available to claim at 62. And if the retirement benefits are below the maximum amount of SSI, then they can get the additional portion in SSI benefits. And again, disability is all or nothing. And did I, is there a question that came in the chat? Yes. So if a veteran is rated 100%, can they still work unless they're rated unemployable? It's my understanding that they cannot work if they're at 100%. And total and uh, unemployable is, um, I mean, it, there's there is a claim for unemployability um, that so if a person is rated less than 100 percent and they are granted the unemployability benefit, then that should bring them up to that 100 percent. So, um, you know, there are the there is that combined rating that can make them unemployable using the unemployability claim um, to bring the person up to 100%. And it is considered a new claim too. So just to keep in mind, um, if a veteran has a 90% rating and they're uh, even just for one thing, say a 90% PTSD rating, and they want to claim unemployability, the TDIU claim, just to be able to get to that 100% level, um, it is a new claim, and that does give the VA the ability to review all claims that are in there. So all ratings, anything that's already ratings, rated, so that 90% rating could go down and and the unemployability would not be granted or may not be granted. So um, just to keep in mind, you know, before making new claims, you do want to consider what your ratings are already before you do that. All right. Um, any anything else? Nope, that was it. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. So, so now when we look at them at a whole, looking at this at the chart when I, with the recaps, it, it really brings out some similarities and differences between VA benefits and the Social Security benefits. 
So all four of them require some sort of impairment or disability diagnosis. The VA pension and SSI are both income-based. The disability, VA disability and SSDI both relate to work. Um, and then both the VA and Social Security are, it will give whichever the higher paying program is. So you can apply for both a pension and service-connected disability at the same time. But like I said, the service-connected disability will be the higher paying program. And so that will be the one that you would get. And same thing with Social Security. SSDI is generally going to be more than SSI. So if you apply for both, then they um, would give both. Um, now, with that said, for Social Security, there is a window of time that is not paid for SSDI. And uh, SSI payments start from the month of the application. So depending on when the onset date is and when the application's made, there may be some SSI coverage until the SSDI kicks in. Um, but it is on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, then both VA pension and SSI will be offset by any of the other benefits. And you can receive both VA disability and SSDI at the same time um, because they're not income-based. Um, and then there are differences as well. The main difference uh, between the VA pension and disability, and they're looking at whether it was service connected or not. The difference between SSDI and SSI is whether there's enough work, whether there was any work history uh, or enough work history. If there wasn't, uh, weren't enough credits put in, then the person would only be eligible for SSI as long as their resources weren't were within the the amount set and their income is under the um, 794. Um, the uh, Social Security standard for disability is different than the VA standard for disability. And this is a hard thing to, to understand sometimes too. Um, when you're, you are 100% rated, whether it's combined or total, um, and uh, and you could be total and permanently disabil disabled under the VA and go for social security benefits. And because they're looking just to see if you are, um, they're looking at your impairments, how long they're lasting or expected to last and whether you can work, their standard is so different that they, they could come up with a different conclusion. Um, but there are always appeal rights and uh, good resources to help you with those appeals. So, and then we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, and you can't get both a pension and VA disability. You can get both SSDI and SSI, as long as it doesn't go over that $794 a month. So remember, if you're looking at the VA benefits and you um, are applying, veterans should make sure that uh, any help that they're getting is from a, an accredited representative, um, someone who's accredited through the VA, and it could be a veteran service officer in a veteran service organization, it could be an attorney, it could be a claims agent. Um, but the VA does require that a person be accredited with them to help with those benefits. Um, and some of the community resources that there are is a veteran service office in Orlando, um, Social Security Administration in Orlando. Uh, they are doing everything by phone right now. Uh, and then 211 can, is always a good resource to have because they can direct you to other resources where you might be able to, um, to get the services you need for either veterans benefits, social security benefits, or both. Um, 
There are also VSOs at the uh, Lake Nona um, Medical Center, VA Medical Center. So that's another place where you can go. Uh, was there another question? There was, but you answered it as you were talking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the question okay. was, what were the resources? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And then there's us, <laughs> Community Legal Services Amid Florida. So we are a full service civil legal aid and law firm. Um, our our um, mission and, and philosophy are to promote equal access to justice. Our primary, our primary clientele are low income people. Um, we are trying to help people to protect their livelihoods, health, and families. Um, there are nearly 1 million people in Central Florida who qualify for our services, and we help about more than 20,000 people in Central Florida each year. And um, so we are funded by grants of different kinds, and a person, a veteran, can always call our helpline and talk to an attorney there who can um, make qualify the person for a grant uh, to see what kind of funding is available for them and make sure they meet the funding requirements. And each of our grantors have different requirements. So um, unfortunately, we can't just blanketly say what those, you know, what is required, um, you know, what kind of income or assets, because um, it could be different for each grant. There may not be an asset requirement with some grants, or there may be a higher income limit for other grants. Um, but our helpline uh, is available. Um, the attorney's there can provide advice in most of the areas where we provide services and they can assess to see if um, if a person needs other services needs more help uh, to be able to transfer the call uh, transfer the the matter to the correct department veterans benefits and public benefits would go to my unit um, veterans benefits would go directly to to me. So if um, you're interested in veterans benefits, call the helpline, see if you qualify for services, and then um, they would just transfer your matter to me um, and would not provide advice on it because um, I'm the accredited attorney for it. So um, there is online application and chat. So if you can't call, you have those options. Would it be acceptable for a veteran to be working with a VSO and consult with CLSMF at the same time? Um, we're always happy to consult. We probably wouldn't do anything more than that because we don't want to uh, interfere with anything that the VSO is doing. Um, but I mean, you're always entitled to a, a like a second opinion it's kind of sometimes it's kind of like going to the doctor's office you need to have a second opinion on things or just a different perspective to understand what the process is you know hearing it a different way or from a different person um but we we're you know we're not we don't want to interfere with anything that a vso would do but we'd be happy to talk to you and and sometimes we work with the vsos as well to see if there's any way we can work together on things. All right. Um, and if, you know, we can take some more questions if there are any more, but I do want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, we have three more Fridays in April. So um, I'll be speaking the next three Fridays at 12 o'clock noon. Um, next week is discharge upgrades. The week after that, I'll be talking about veterans dependent and survivor benefits. And then the week after that, the last one will be access to healthcare inside and outside of the VA.